Well, good evening. Would you please stand and worship the Lord Jesus Christ in song? It's good to see you. this time we'll take up our offering. Our deacons are coming with the offering tray. Yes. And remember the goats. Charlotte says, remember the goats. And Lottie Moon. Yes, that's right. We need to put some of those envelopes back here, don't we? Body Moon, goats. <laughs> I'll never live that. Christmas. <laughs> yeah, goats and boats. <laughs> the Christmas dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure everybody brings me dessert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots what of are dessert. you cooking, Ray? Is it going to just be dessert? I'm cooking everything it's but dessert. Okay. <laughs> no, you're not. Your wife is. We're yeah. gonna have we're gonna have barbecue, salad, potatoes, beans. Barbecue salad. Wow, barbecue salad, boy. <laughs> There's a comma there. <laughs> and we want to invite everyone for lunch next Sunday. <clears throat> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for, for having us back in your church tonight, for providing the transportation, for providing our health. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Bless this offering tonight, Lord, that this offering can be used for missions work so that other people can come to know you in a special way and know your love. We appreciate your love. We thank you for it. And we return your love back to you and showing your love to others. We look forward to learning more about your word tonight and the covenants that have been made throughout the years. And we're thankful, Lord, that that everything has been based on your word through your Bible that you've left for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. season and so we're singing we're going to do the first verse and the fourth verse if that's okay with Danny the first verse and the fourth verse connect okay go it came up time our pastor's coming amen
Well, good evening. Hope we're excited about a, a time tonight. And I'm going to start off with a question. Sometimes we want to take questions, but I've got a question. We just sang Glory in Excelsis Deo. Now I gotta brush. I don't. You gotta help me brushing up on my Latin here. What was exactly? Does Glory that, to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. In excelsis is highest. Is that the Deo? Yeah. Deo, is, uh, Deo. I take it as deity. Is that the Deo okay? Is king. Huh? Deo is king. Yeah. Is king. So it means God. glory to God in the huh? Oh God. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, if I'm going to sing it, I might as well know what I'm saying. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm singing in tongues back there, and I don't know what I'm saying. So, you know. <laughs> Glory to God in the highest. Okay. Well, we are going to come back uh, tonight, uh, pick back up with our uh, trek through the Baptist faith and message. We're in section number six, having to do with the church. Uh, we talked about it a little bit uh, last time, and we will see if we can get through with it this time. There's uh, several good things to talk about, some interesting things, as well as some controversial things. And so, uh, depending on, uh, we'll just uh, see if see if we can make it all the way all the way through. But we'll start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, we'll pick it back up. Our Father, Lord, we do uh, give you uh, a praise. You are the high and the lofty one. You are holy. There is no one. Uh, like uh, you, and you are beyond uh, compare. Uh, Lord, might you uh, so work in our hearts and minds that we might uh, sanctify you as um, uh, as Lord, uh, and that we might live our life accordingly. Bless our time tonight as we think about uh, the great uh, subject of the church. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, uh, uh, I don't know if you had me get my little thing here. I don't think I'm going to read the two paragraphs. I read it last time. I'm just going to kind of hit some of the sections that, uh, um, and so we'll just kind of hit it as we as we go along. But it's in this section uh, number six on the church. Uh, kind of want to start off by way of a, a quick a review that the, the church. When we we think of the church, that the church. It literally means uh, the called out ones or the gathered assembly. So when we talk about the church, we're not talking about the building. We're talking about the people, those that God has uh, called out of the world, gathered uh, and brought to himself. And when we gather together, when the individual believers assemble together, uh, that is the church. Now, the, uh, this is section in the Baptist Faith and Message. There's two main paragraphs. Uh, the last paragraph talks about essentially the church universal uh, because the Bible does define the church as all believers throughout all time from every tribe, language, people, and nation from uh, the earliest believers from the book of Genesis to the last of the believers at the end of Revelation. But uh, all believers throughout all time periods equal the body of Christ. We are the church universal, uh, and throughout all of eternity, we will we will be uh, be, be together. Uh, but the main part of this uh, this section, and usually when we think about the church, and when the New Testament talks about the church. It's not just talking about the universal church generally, but talking about the local church, the, uh, the gathered believers that we're in a certain locale and they come together in a certain location. And so we are the local uh, church. Uh, we believe very uh, strongly in the local church. Most of the New Testament is written to the uh, local churches, to the church in Rome and Corinth and Galatia and Smyrna and Philadelphia. Uh, and in fact, it's those in these towns. In fact, not just in the towns. We read in Romans 16, 5, a church that meets in a house. And so wherever these believers gather together, uh, that, uh, that is the church. We are the church in Oklahoma City. We're class and Boulevard Baptist Church. We're the group of believers that meet in this uh, particular location. Because again, the church is not a building of the church. Uh, is you know is is the people uh, we noted last week that the church belongs to Christ. He said that he would build his church. Uh, we do believe that each individual church is autonomous. We're self-governing, self-operating. Um, though we do in our uh, denomination or association, we cooperate friendly with other like-minded churches. But each individual church is independent. It is composed of baptized believers. We believe that. Uh, to be a member of the church, you actually need to be a, a genuine believer. You need to be baptized. In fact, one of the um, uh, uh, 
distinct distinctives of uh, Baptists is we believe in a regenerate church membership. Uh, we don't think unbelievers ought to be a part or of the membership of the church. Uh, it is only those who have a genuine profession, uh, genuine profession of faith. And baptism, we believe that believers' baptism is kind of the portal or the doorway uh, into church um, membership. Uh, one of the things that our thing uh, does say, we briefly mentioned last week, uh, that it says that we're associated by covenant and faith. Um, um, and Stephanie found out, uh, uh, that we actually have a church covenant at our church. Uh, didn't know that. I mean, church covenants used to be more in vogue in generations uh, past. Uh, but, but we have a church covenant as a part to be a member of Classen Boulevard uh, a Baptist Church. As Stephanie said, you know, in the back of our hymnals, we don't use anymore. Sometimes those covenants are plastered there, just kind of a generic one. But let me just read you some of the uh, excerpts from our church covenant that all believers here in this local church say that we're going to do. That we uh, promise that we're going to walk together in Christian love and in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we will sustain the church's worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, that we will strive to maintain family and private Bible study and prayer to educate our children in the Christian biblical faith, to seek the salvation of our family and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, uh, and to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, exemplary in our deportment, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, and to remember one another in prayer, and to aid one another in sickness and distress, and to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and Christian courtesy and speech, and to be slow to take offense and always ready for reconciliation. I mean, there's... It, it's really, a, 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 and that, that's only uh, maybe a, a third of it, but it's just, you know, believers in this church, it, it's part of our constitution that we're going to promise to do this. To, uh, in fact, there's, you know, there's, there's several things here, but, but that is something that uh, historically we as Baptists believe, that, that a church, we're united together in fellowship, uh, we're associated by covenant. Uh, then we ended last time talking about... Um, Observing the two ordinances. What are the two ordinances we observe as in, in the church? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these two ordinances to be, we would say, exercised properly need to be done in a church setting, in the assembly. They're not private individual ordinances. We can't have a a private baptism, you know, by ourselves in the bathtub. I mean, it's something to be done in the, in the assembly when the church gathers together. We gather together for baptism when we gather together for partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's something that the church does together as a gathering. So that's kind of where we've been uh, by way of a review, and we're going to pick it up uh, from there. Uh, anything y'all want to discuss on that quick review? Um, Got copies of the covenant here, the old one and the new one. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. She, there is a yeah. copies over here. The uh, if, if if you want to see the copy of our church covenant, that's part of our church constitution and bylaws. Uh, we can can pass those. In. It's kind of interesting to read what it is that, and I, I I think that any new member ought to be familiar with this. That if you're going to be a member of a church, hey, this is what this is what we're signing up. Uh, you know, uh, you know, signing up for. In fact, part of the, you know, the, the church covenant ends, it says, you know, if, if we remove from active membership, then we will, as soon as possible, unite with another church for strength and fellowship, where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of the Word of God. I mean, we're almost promising, if we're not going to go here and assembly in this place, we're going to go somewhere else and assemble there. It's, 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 it's part, of, part of the covenant and part of the, of the promise. But again, that, like I said, that was more, more common in times past. It's kind of gone out of vogue, um, you know, in this uh, recent generation. I mean, I remember the church covenant on the wall of the church, you know, when I, when I was young. You remember that, that June, you know? And so it was just part of a weekly reminder. Hey, we, you know, we're... You know, we're not just loosely assembled here. We're, you know, we're bound by um, bound by a commitment to each other in a, in, you know, in a in a local place. Yeah. I think it's important 
too, that we know that and that we, you know. Yeah. I, I just think that it's a good thing. I, 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 you know, I think it is too. I, I was convicted when she, you know, she put that and said, hey, we, uh, you know, I mentioned it last week and I didn't know if we had a church covenant and sure enough we do and it was, it's in our constitution and bylaws and I read it and I'm like, wow, you know, there's some things I need to be better engaged in because that's just part of being a membership of the church. You know, uh, you know, I, you know, let some things, you know, slip. I mean, the strive to maintain family and private devotions, uh, you know, to educate my children, seeking salvation. It talks about for the relief of the poor and evangelism. I mean, there's, there's just things that we, as a church, we are promising that as, when we come together and as assembly, this is what we're going to be about. Um, uh, and I know other people and uh, leaders have, you know, recommended that uh, to have a, a covenant renewal you know, almost kind of like, you know, an annual thing that we're reminded, kind of like an anniversary, you know, you're, you're reminded of your covenant with your spouse. You know, you're, there's that reminder. Well, there ought to be a time as a church, hey, work together, and this is what we promise to do when, we, when we're a part of this local assembly. And so I, I think a covenant is, uh, uh, can be, as you said, Margaret, you know, a very, very important thing that maybe we ought to give more thought and attention to. Um, and, you know, maybe could maybe work on you know making one that would be um, oh, tailor made for us but 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 th this is the one that we have right now the, so. yeah the older one the one with the courier font is from 1952 and you know, the church was begun this was found in the minutes just you know like mm -hmm. months mm -hmm. into it when they constituted this is what they had and it's kind of based on um, one that Southern Baptists had already put out. They just kind of took that and ran with it. Yeah. And then this came, the second one came when they redid the Constitution and Bylaws. And it was kind of in that format that was already, that she downloaded and did. It was kind of, so they're really similar, mm -hmm. but this really is the first one. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and that one, and I did look. It's on the back page of the hymn, the hymnal back. Yeah, the, yeah, the the you know the hymnal, and it's just kind of you know plastered in there. But anyway, that's just, but that's uh, historically something that we have uh, believed as you know as as Baptist. But but just before we started talking about that, you mentioned that the Lord's Supper and the baptism uh -huh. should be here as a group or something, uh -huh. and we do take the Lord's Supper to people that can't. You know the shut-ins and things. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I, I do think that is, um, you know, something that can be considered for someone that can't come to the assembly. I think, um, you know, I think that the church, uh, you know, ought to to make make that available. Um, uh, I remember at the former church I was at, there was a, a lady, and she she couldn't come she couldn't come to church. And when we would have the Lord's Supper, it was time we went to her house. You know, so that she could partake as well. But you know, when when I say that you know you know bab you know baptism is not just something I could individually do. It, it's it this is a public assembly type thing. Now it could be done in a in a house church. I mean, there's house churches you know mentioned, but I you know it, it's it's those are corporate ordinances. You know, and so yes, I do think that there's. You know the, the shut-in. We can you know you know take the uh, take it take it to them, um, and I think you say that they'll they'll watch the recording and when we have the Lord's Supper together, then you know so essentially you know via technology they are partaking with us. But I think that those are the exceptions that prove the rule, that that those those ordinances are corporate things. Um, uh, that's, I think I mentioned last time, you know, there, in times past there was controversy over people that would make a profession of faith at Falls Creek. And sometimes they'd baptize them in a creek down there. And then there were certain churches that said, hey, that, you know, just because the, you know, the, the, the youth director baptized them in, in the creek, the church says, well, hey, this is, this is a church ordinance. This is something that needs to be observed and recognized by the church. And, you know, can that be done individually off by yourself um you know so and and i think you know we would say that these are public ordinances because the church is public huh? it's a testimony yeah <clears throat> yeah that you know i with um and i'm hoping we can have a baptism here you know here soon but it you know it's a time for a public profession of faith 
And so the church needs to hear that profession of faith because that's the doorway into the church. I have, I have heard what they believe, you know, and so that, uh, and they have identified themselves with Christ publicly, you know, and so it, it's part of the pub of the the, the, the public assembly. Um, in fact, a part of the church history, one of the first uh, is it uh, Smith. In the early 1600s, the first when the curse came here to America, and they, him, and I forget the other guy's name, they practiced, I think, what was called sea baptism, where they, they you know, it was, um, they were convinced of immersion. They essentially baptized themselves, you know, <laughs> and because they, and, you know, and, you know, maybe in, the, in, in that instance, they wanted to, to make a, uh, you know, you know, make a statement, but we, we would say, you know, it is. It is. It's in the public assembly, you know. That the, the you know that these ordinances are to be observed. These aren't private things. They're public things. Part of the church. Um, anything else before we? Yes. When uh, I was with feeding children, uh, I would uh, take uh, Billy Graham's film around and show it. Mm. And on one church somewhere in the south. Uh, a man converted at the ser at the service, but they didn't have a baptistry, so we went out to a pond, mm -hmm. and the church watched while we baptized mm -hmm. in the pond. Yeah, and I don't think there's baptizing in a pond, in a river, in a lake, in a bucket. You know, I mean, you know, it it it, it doesn't have to be in a church a church building because again, the church is not the building, but the church is to be gathered. You know that's the church. They're gathered together to observe observe those um, the observe those ordinances. And if you gather at a pond, great. You gather at a swimming pool, great. You know, but it, it's to be a gathering of you know a public gathering at you know at a church. It's not a um, you know a, a, a private a, a private thing. It's a public thing because the church the church is public. Anything else? Just, just, so I have a question. Uh -huh. Just your example of the Falls Creek baptism mm -hmm. in the creek. If the youth group and the other churches around were there and Whitman, usually that's what happens, is mm -hmm. that there's a great gathering that comes to watch baptisms mm -hmm. in the creek at, at Falls Creek. Would you think, because that's not the whole of the local church, that that would not be... I mean, is that what you're saying? Because the whole well, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know all the specific details, you know, in you know, in some of those. I just know that, and I think it would be up to each individual local church. If they said, would we accept a baptism if you know they went off to camp and and they just baptized them in a creek, you know, and and the church, the local church didn't see it, didn't hear it, was, wasn't a, a part of, you know, a part of that. And so that church would have to, you know, talk about would we accept that, you know, if it was just observed by a few in the church or, or, or what, you know. Um, and, you know, it's like, well, people will go to Israel and they want to be baptized in the Jordan River. I mean, are, is that a real baptism? I, I would say, you know, yes, but each local church is going to say, you know, what are we going to, um, oh, you know, what are we going to, to, to recognize? There has to be a, uh, you know, a, I say a public declaration of faith before a gathered group of believers. You know, now everybody's not gonna, gonna be there at every baptism, but I think that, that needs to happen. Um, and then if they come back to the church, well, this happened in front of believers and then they can recall and rehearse that testimony. We do accept membership on a statement that was done in front of a group of believers. And so, uh, but, but I think different local assemblies would probably, some would be stricter on that, you know, than others. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm thinking of an example that was told me of a pastor that went into a, a home and baptized a woman in her bathtub, just the pastor and, you know, would that be acceptable? Well, why not do that publicly? I mean, it seems a little bit inappropriate, uh, but, but you know, I, I would question something like that, you know, because it's just a one-on-one -on -one private, no, it needs to be a, a public thing. But that, that would be kind of personally how, you know, how I, how I would see it. But if it's a public observance of the ordinance with a public testimony that believe, the gathered believers observed and can corroborate, um, Ask, can it be two or three people 
and that would be the church if everybody can't get together. Yeah, I don't think that there has to be a the certain point number. Is for it to be well, public. The point yeah. is for people to be able to witness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Think it's, of the eunuch who was on the road. Yeah. You know, he probably had a servant or two with him. But when he said, "Look, here is water. Why can I not be baptized?" I mean, they didn't have time to even call a crowd. Yeah. Yeah, he was, you know, he, he was, and so there's, you know, that, there's, there's a, a, an example that might great go against what our tradition would be in having the gathered public assembly, because that was pretty private, maybe in front of other unbelievers, but, it, you know, it was public, but it was a, definitely a reduced crowd, and there were at least two believers there, you know, Philip and the eunuch, but... I think um, the biggest thing there is not to think of public in the terms of you need lots of folks, but rather you're not hiding it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that you know that, that's, that's a great point there. And that yeah. there's an official yeah. there. Yeah, there's, there's an official recognition by the church and before the world that that person is identifying with Christ. Um, and, and, and take and video yourself, baptizing yourself, and then put it on Facebook doesn't do that. Huh? No. <laughs> How creative. Is that how you do it? Falls Creek has a big influence on a lot of people, but there are kids that go to Falls Creek mm -hmm. and then never really get into a mm -hmm. church. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've dealt with, uh, you know, counseled, you know, some kids that have gone to camps down there and they've made the profession of faith and, you know, and all the camp. And then you talk to them and they didn't, I mean, they didn't know anything, you know, and I've, in fact, I've refused baptism to some of them because they, they didn't understand, you know, basic who Jesus was. And, you know, all they did is, you know, raise a hand or, and so if that happens, they raised a hand, they put them in some water, and you come back, do you accept them in membership if, if there's no credible profession of faith? And so, you know, part of the public assembly of that is so for the church to, to verify this uh, 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 genuine, credible profession of faith. Uh, because, as we'll talk to you a little bit, that's part of the privileges of the church. We can assure one another about our faith. But when that's unseen, you can't do that. And to support the new believer. Yeah. If you don't mm -hmm. see it, then... Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, moving on. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. How come we don't observe, observe foot washing? Well, it's not really Yeah, uh, I foot wash. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that. I want to massage along with it. Yeah. Yeah, my. Yeah. My, you know, my dad uh, often supplies at a church. In fact, I've supplied their uh, little brethren church that they observe foot washing, and they at least once a year. Uh, around Easter, they'll have a they'll have a, a, a foot washing service. Why we, you know, we don't don't do it uh, when G when Jesus washed the, the disciples' feet, you know, as as an example. I mean, he told me, he said, "You don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will understand." And so, it we would say that that his um, example of foot washing there was not an ordinance for us to to do, but it was an example. Not like baptize, you know, baptism, and not like the, the the Lord's Supper, because it was more than than just just washing the feet. But I I wouldn't throw rocks if someone wanted to have a foot washing service. I mean, yeah. okay, you know. Carol goes every three weeks. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. massage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, they, I, I I don't know how many denominations observe that you know that ordinance, but. Um, you know, most we would we would just recognize two. Uh, I mentioned the Roman Church has seven, uh, and some would have three if they include foot washing. Um, but but he didn't tell us to do that. Okay, so he's really not talking about foot washing. Right. Yeah, I mean it. That as an example. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it. You know, it. It wasn't. It wasn't just the act of. You know, of, of foot washing. Uh, of course, the other, other ordinances. It's not just the act. Act either. It's what it represents. And, uh, but, 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 but we wouldn't recognize. We wouldn't recognize the, um, foot washing as being a required ordinance where Christ ordained do this in remembrance of me. To be a church, we have to have the Lord's Supper. You have to baptize. I mean, th these are requirements. They're ordained by God, by Christ. But we don't, we don't think that Christ has ordained that I, um, uh, 
foot washing. But, but, but like I said, I'm you know if if someone wants to say that, and that's I think that's more power to them. I mean, I'm I'm not going to squawk. Um, uh, let's okay. Let's see if we can move on here. Um, in the let's see, about a quarter of the way down maybe a third of the way down, da, 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 observing the two ordinances, and it says governed by his laws uh, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested uh, to them. One thing about uh, the church is that in the church we are governed by the laws of Christ. We believe uh, as the local church that scripture reigns supreme, that it is the law of God that is king, and it is the ruler uh, and it is the, uh, the final arbiter for anything that happens within the church. Now there are other, we have other rules in the church. Some churches, we, we, you know, we use Robert's rules of order. We have our own traditions. We have you know, the, these things, but all of those are subordinate to, tr to, 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 to scripture. Our traditions, they get passed down. It's just kind of the way that, you know, way that we do things. Those things can be okay but they are never to usurp scripture and they are always to submit and are subordinate to scripture. We are governed by Christ's laws. This also applies to the pastor as well as to church leadership that you know, anything done in the church is to be governed by God's laws. We are subordinate to scripture. If, if I go off into left field, then the church is to bring me back. Hey, this is outside of Scripture because Scripture is what governs uh, what, what governs the local assembly. Uh, and, and it says that in the assembly, the, the word is, uh, is, is an important aspect and that the word, it says, in, invest members with gifts, rights, and privileges. Uh, one thing when the, the local assembly, we, we come together that it is the, the, the place where we, uh, where we exercise our gifts uh, to the mutual benefit of the body. God has gifted his, uh, his church. We read in Ephesians 4, 8 that, that, God, uh, that Christ uh, has given gifts to men uh, and that those gifts are for the edification and the building up of the body. And so one of the benefits of the local church, we come together so that we can exercise our gifts. We all have different gifts, but when we come together, we can mutually encourage one another with the gifts in and within the local, and within the local assembly. We also, in the church, there are certain, it says, rights and privileges. Uh, you know, church membership ought to be, ought to be special. Um, and, and there are certain privileges attached to church, uh, church membership and to being a, a, a part of the church that those outside of the church uh, don't, don't get. Um, one verse, Hebrews 13 and verse number 10, it talks about that there are some who have no right to eat at our table. Okay. And so one of the privileges of being in the gathered assembly is the Lord's Supper. This is something that is reserved only for the church and only for, for believers. And those outside don't get that right. They do not get that privilege. It is, it is reserved. They have no right. It is reserved only for the gathered family. Uh, something else that I think is one of the rights and privileges of the church is the assurance and the reassurance that we get from each other. Uh, in interacting with each other and confirming and encouraging each other in the faith. Because you know that that assurance and reassurance cannot be given to those outside the church. That is not a right and it is not a privilege for those that do not gather. You can't, you can't give it, you can't give them the assurance. You can't give them the re reassurance in their faith and in the struggle because they're not in the group. They're not mutually joined to other believers. This is where that happens. It's part of the right and the privileges within the church. That's why it's dangerous when people never come to church because you, they're, they're not benefiting from that right and they can't have it uh, because that can only happen within the, the gathered and local assembly. Uh, so the, the, the rights and privileges, the gifts are a, a big deal uh, here that, that's mentioned. Um, something else says about the church, again, about a third of the way down, it says, in seeking to extend the gospel to the, uh, to the ends of the earth. Um, uh, the church, uh, the gathered church is to be engaged in missionary and evangelistic enterprises. It's part of why 
uh, Christ uh, has us here and has us together. It's together. Uh, I mean, the, the great commission, uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 and following, uh, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Christ has all the authority. And he says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe uh, all that I command, uh, command you. So here, when the, when the church gathers uh, together, the church is to gather, but the church is also to go. And we're to, we're to make disciples. We're to baptize those disciples in the triune name of God. And we're to teach them to observe everything that Christ commanded us. Part of disciple making is this discipline and being disciplined as a believer. And that happens within the, within the local church. And part of that is going and going and telling and being involved um, uh, in a missionary and evangelistic uh, 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 enterprise. Uh, let's see here. I'm... By us being part of Lottie, Lottie Moon, right? Hmm? By us being part of Lottie Moon or the Southern Baptist. Yeah, and, the, you know, and that is, you know, that is a, an area to where I think as Southern Baptists, uh, it's, it's where we have excelled. Because even though there were a whole bunch of in, independent autonomous churches, we, we do cooperate together for a missionary enterprise. Uh, it's been the, you know, the, you know, the heartbeat and the thrust of Southern Baptists to take the gospel to the world. Uh, because this, you know, this is what uh, God and Christ, Christ has the local church to do. Uh, we are to take the gospel to the, end, uh, to the ends of the earth. Um, uh, it says here uh, after that um, that each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ through the democratic process. Uh, now, church government or church polity, the way churches uh, operate and are governed, this is one of the biggest dividers in denominations. It's why there's different denominations. It's how these local assemblies, you know, are governed. And there's there's three main types of of, of church polity or the politics of the church or church government. There's, there's a, a hierarchy, uh, there is an elder rule or a Presbyterian rule, and there is a congregational rule. You know, the hierarchy is, you know, essentially there's, there's you know, the figurehead that kind of, you know, makes all the decisions. The, the ultimate in that is, is the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope rules. Uh, there's elder rule where there's just kind of a, a group of people that, that rule and make all the decisions in the church. Now we would fall under a congregational democratic rule to where we say it's, it's the church makes those decisions. That's why we have you know, business meetings uh, every month because we're congregational rule. And in fact, it's kind of interesting that, you know, that all three uh, types of this uh, government are represented in how our nation operates. You know, our nation was uh, formed and the three types of church government is really how our nation governs itself. We are a democratic republic. There are, there is a, a hierarchy in a sense. There is a president, but there's also a, a group. There's representatives. There's a group of elders, the House of Representatives that we're not making every decision, but there is a group of people that are making decisions for us. But there's also the democratic voting process where we vote for our, you know, for our representatives. So really our own nation encompasses the three main forms of church government. Uh, as, as Baptist, we are democratic and we are congregational rule that we believe that the, the church is the one that, uh, that comes together and makes these, these decisions. It is a democratic process under the Lordship of Christ. Now, that there, if I turn to Matthew 18, there's an example of this that's often used in re regards to a small prayer meeting, uh, but it's not talking about a small prayer meeting. Uh, you, you know the passage where two or three are gathered together in my uh, name, there I am in the midst. Well, how, how many have to be praying for Jesus to be there and to listen? One, one, you know, it, it doesn't even take two or three. If you're praying by yourself, Christ is there. And, but, but here in, the, in this passage in Matthew chapter 18 in verses uh, eight, eight, 18 to 20, um, it's talking with dealing with sin. 
and dealing with sin in the church, uh, Jesus gives a process and he gets down to a point and he says, if, if they won't listen to the two or three, then you tell it to the church. And we read in verse 18, truly I tell you, whatever you bind, bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth would have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything, uh, that they may ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. Uh, I didn't read verse, verse 17. He says, tell, tell it to the church, the gathered assembly. And so when the gathered assembly comes together and comes to a decision, the, that democratic process, Christ is saying, I am there in the midst, and that is my decision. Okay, and so it is the, we believe the church is ruled through the democratic process under the lordship of Christ. That a group of, of gathered, genuine believers, we make decisions. And when we make those decisions, Christ says, I am with you in that decision. Okay, that, that, that's how we believe the church ought to operate. It is demo, it's the democratic process under the lordship of Christ. That's also why it is so essential that we only have believers in the church. And only believers, genuine believers, take place in making the decision in the decision-making process of the church. We do not want unbelievers making decisions for how the church is to operate. Because Christ, it's where the gathered assembly comes together and the believers make that decision. And when, when Jesus says, when two or three of you, when y'all are gathered together, then I, I'm putting my stamp of approval on that decision, on the democratic process uh, um, under the lordship of Christ. Because Christ governs his church through his people uh, as, he works, uh, as he works through them in, you know, in, in the local assembly. But like I said, this, this whole thing on how the church is to be governed, it's, it's a big, uh, oh, like I said, it's a, big, it's a big divider. That's why there's different denominations. You know, some, they have got a bishop making all the decisions, and some, there's just a group of guys making it, and some are, you know, but, but in our, 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 our church, we are democratic. Uh, we are congregational, congregational rule as a, you know, so, as a so church. So voting would be one of the rights or privileges. Voting is one of the rights or privileges. Yeah, a, 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 a non-member does not have a vote. You know, we will come together and we make, you know, the decisions on different things and what we do in ministry or, or you know, whatever. And the, the church is making those decisions and, and the church is to be regenerate, baptized believers that have a genuine profession of faith. So you have spirit filled people making these decisions. Uh, and so that, you know, that's the, the, um, the idea on this is how the church is to operate. That's why you don't want people that are not filled with the spirit that are not regenerate making those decisions. Uh, and that's why, the, you know, we believe in a regenerate church membership because I think, you know, churches, denominations, you get in problem, you know, when you have, unregenerate people, people that are not born again and are not spirit filled making decisions because they are not making them by the spirit. They'll make them in the flesh and it, 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 it breeds corruption. Uh, that's why, as, like I said, the, uh, you, know, a, you know, as a church, one of our distinctives, we try, strive for a pure church in a Baptist church, at least historically speaking, um, because of the way we're governed. Uh, you wanna, any, any, any questions on that? Um, I don't know, I just had the thought about when you hear people make comments, sometimes they'll say, I don't believe in an organized, what did they say, an organized church. Well, organized religion. Just can't start. That mm -hmm. means they don't like to go to church. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll see what, I mean, God, God has ordained government. You know, God is not a God of disorder. Um, um, it, well, in fact, the, let me just, I'll just move the very next phrase there after uh, uh, each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ and the democratic process. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord. One thing, you know, God saves us individual. We're individual believers, but he brings us into a gathering. And when the gathered assembly within the church, I have responsibilities and I have accountability to each member within that church. You know, the, the church should not be a place of anarchy and disarray. It's not just total individualism where we do whatever we want. God brings us together and under a orderly government. 
to where we're governed, we're disciplined uh, uh, as the people of God. That's we're discipled. You know, Jesus says, go make disciples. Go make people that are disciplined, that will you teach them everything that I have, you know, I have commanded you. And that happens within the church. In fact, there's um, um, a definition of what a, a true church is. And the, the most prominent one is the church is a place where the word is rightly pre preached and the ordinances are rightly observed. But there's also uh, sometimes a third one put in there that not only a church has to be a place where the word is rightly preached and the ordinances are rightly observed, but it's also where there is discipline. Because if there is not discipleship going, the discipline of the people within the church, then that is not a church. Uh, at least, you know, because when we come together, we're accountable to each other. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I have to be accountable to David. If David sees something wrong with me, he say, you know, Tim, you know, what's going on here? And I'm responsible. And that happens within the church. I, I am not just independent on my own, can do whatever I please. God has put us together in a group to be organized, uh, orderly, and governed, and we are accountable to each other, and we're to hold each other accountable. That's part of the church. It's dangerous when I go off by myself because, you know, I, I can't see myself very well. You know, I need others to examine me, um, and, that, and that happens within, uh, within the local assembly. And we shouldn't be surprised when people who are not members of a church and have been going to church and they don't understand mm -hmm. that rules and etiquette, you know, within the church, and so they'll say, Pastor, what did you mean by that last comment that you just made, you know, while you're preaching? You know? yeah. It's like, okay, okay, this guy, don't be too hard on him, he doesn't understand. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, you know, the, the, I think that the church is, there's, we, we call it an order of worship, we're to be orderly, we're not, we're not to be, in, you know, in, in disarray, but, you know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I sure wasn't. I, I was encouraged by that. You know, it's if 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 there's there's a need that needs to be addressed. I I, I you know I, I think that's good. I think we can be so rigid. You know, I mean, sometimes I you know I'll make notes and I think okay, this is the way it's got to go. But you know, sometimes that that hedges me in, and I'm I need to be you know open uh, to. Uh, you know, to if, if something happens outside of my rigid, you know, my rigid order. Um, Does anyone know what happened to him? He came a few times. I've seen. It, periodically, he shows up. I see him out here playing ball every now and again. Oh, yeah. But I, um, then I've asked ask him to come. So I don't, you know, you know, hopefully he'll come back. Yeah. But. He's got a lot of our Bibles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've all given him. <laughs> Um, okay, we're going to get into some, okay, uh, some of this stuff that might be a little, it talks about uh, just a little over halfway down after that we're responsible and accountable to each other in the church. And again, that's one of the rights and privileges, something we ought to enjoy and we ought to engage in, you know, with each other and holding each other accountable uh, and being responsible to each other. But now it talks about the scriptural offices. It's scriptural officers within the church are pastors and deacons. Uh, as Baptists, we believe that there's just two offices within the church, uh, officers, and that is pastors and deacons. I've already mentioned that church government is a big divider, and the divider is over some of the Bibli uh, New Testament terms used for the officers in, in the church. There's this uh, Greek term, episkopos, or what we get, bishop. It means an overseer. Um, there's a term presbyter, or pres presbys, I think it is, or, or presbyter, it means an elder. It's just an older or mature person in the faith. But if someone wants to be an elder or a presbyter in the church, he, you know, he's, he's, he's desiring a good thing. Then there's also a term for the shepherd or the pastor. Now, I take all of those three terms, the, the bishop or the overseer, the presbyter, the elder, the mature person in the faith, and the pastor, that these are just kind of synonymous terms. As Baptists, we say, we, generally speaking, I'd say we say these are just synonymous terms. They're three terms talking about the same office. It's just using a, a, a different phraseology, a different word to describe the function, but it's the same office. 
um, uh, others take that these are distinct roles, that there is the role of a bishop, there is a role of a presbyter, and there is a, a role of an elder, there's a role of a pastor, and these are different offices. As Baptists, we, we just say that there's two offices. There's a pastor, which encompasses being an overseer. You know, a pastor is to be look out on the horizon and to be aware of false doctrine and, you know, to be, be aware of those dangers. He's to be an elder. He's to be mature in the faith. And he's to be a pastor and a shepherd and, and to lead in a spiritual manner. And so we kind of think that those are just the functions of that, you know, of, you know, of, of, the, of that one office. So we would say one, one office is a pastor. And the other office that as Baptists we hold is the office of a deacon. We have deacons in our church, um, and a deacon, uh, the term diakonos, uh, Ray, you're going to love this one. You know what diakonos really means? It means running through the dust, okay? A deacon, the, this office in the church is someone that runs through the dust. You know, the office of, of a pastor is someone that oversees and is, and is looking out for danger. Uh, he's shepherding and leading in a spiritual way, and that, that's, that's his function. The office of a deacon is someone that is a servant. They are told to do something, and they run through the dust to, to go and, and to do the things that need to be done in the orderly operation uh, in the orderly operation of the, you know, of, of, of the church. That's what a deacon does. I have now, this vision of a sheepdog. Yeah, well, that's, a, and, and, but, but, but that's, that, that's the role of the deacon. You remember when, when the deacons were first established, I think it's Acts chapter 6, and this issue over the distribution of food among the, the, the widows, and so they, they established these deacons to take care of this business. You know, they were, they were leaders in the church, and they were spiritually minded people, but they ran through the dust, to, to take care of these old things, to serve in this way so that the apostles could devote themselves to prayer and to, and to preaching. And so there's certain, uh, uh, you know, Timothy gives certain requirements for it, you know, for a deacon to, you know, they, they, need, they need to have a, a, a certain high spiritual acumen to have this high position within the church. If I watched a football game yesterday, I don't, did anybody you all watch the, the Wake Forest game, a little bit of the Wake Forest? We, we, we have a Baptist seminary at Wake Forest. And do you know what their mascot is, the Wake Forest? Tiger. Hmm? Devils? Well, half of, the Demon Deacons. The Demon Deacons of Wake Forest. Now, I've heard my dad's been a pastor all his life, and he's told me he's run into a bunch of demon deacons. <laughs> but, but, de but, but the deacons in the church are not to be demons. They, they, they're, they're, they're the servants that that run through the dust to, to take care of the operation in an orderly manner of how the church operates. That's how God governs his local assembly, through pastors and through deacons. The deacons serve the church membership and they serve the church leadership. That's, that's, that's their office. That is their role. Yeah, someone had a, a question. Oh, it's, Are they in North Carolina? Yeah, I, I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think North. I don't know. I don't know if they won last night or not. I just know they were playing. But, um, but, but we do. I think. Uh, yeah, one of our seminaries was there. In fact, I heard that seminary referred to as Woke Forest because there's some issues going on in that seminary, and it's not Wake Forest. It's Woke Forest because I'm, you know, wondering if they're they're going woke. Uh, but I and I hope they're not raising up demon deacons uh, because uh, you know the, the deacon is an important office within the church. Uh, within an important role. So, so we do believe in these, these two offices within the church. There's the office of the pastor and there's the office of the deacon. Uh, and there's one last point here and we got four minutes. Um, and let me just read it. It's the last sentence in the first paragraph. While both men and women are gifted to serve in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture. Right. Well, we're out of time, and we're just gonna, we'll just, uh, thank you. <laughs> I do, uh, yeah, I, we're, we're out. I don't think that we'll, uh, but, but here, you know, here in our Baptist faith and message, it talks about the offices in, in the church, but uh, it, it does say that we believe as, as Baptists that this office of a, of a pastor is limited 
to qualifying men or to men that are qualified by, you know, by scripture. It's not just uh, anybody, it's those who meet that certain qualification and that women are not to be the pastor of the church. Uh, they are not to be pastors in the church. Now, this, this issue uh, is becoming more and more debate within our own denomination. Uh, we've talked about it a, the, the, a little bit. I mean, the whole thing with, uh, with Beth Moore. There are certain Southern Baptist churches that are ordaining women uh, pastors, uh, even the North American Mission Board, and they're planting churches. Some churches have been planted with, uh, with the church, church pastors. Uh, they have... Because it raised a little bit of a controversy, the North American Mission Board has since clarified and kind of corrected uh, some of that, saying that they would be in line with our statement of faith and the Baptist faith and message on that the role of pastor is reserved for just qualified men. Yeah. But they could be an evangelist, but they can't have a church. Is that is that the only difference? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, Titus chapter two and verse three: w women can teach. And women are, are to teach, um, but women are not to be the pastor of the church. Uh, God, in his ordering of life, whether it's family life or whether it's church life, has set up a headship, and the leadership of the church is to be led by a man. Uh, that um, there's, we can look at, like I said, we're, we're at, do we want to get into this now? No, or do we want to talk that. Okay. No, let's do it. Huh? We had a short sermon this morning. We could finish well, there's, up. there's a lot of women, oh God, there what did I just call that word, evangelists, mm. but they're not. Is it, mm. So is that me, considered yeah. preaching or is that considered teaching? Women yeah, well, that, that, you know, this is going to be a, a debate going on within our denomination right now, you know, and, but a from our Baptist faith and message, what we say we hold to is that the office of pastor is restricted to a qualified man. Um, uh, now, there, um, we, we can look at a, a couple of uh, verses on that. First uh, Timothy chapter two. Um, well, uh, I, I, well if first, we can throw one overboard. We can throw them all overboard. What's that? So if we can throw one rule overboard, we can throw them all overboard. And, and, and this right here, I mean, this does not fit within our modern society at all. Good. This grades against modern society. And people will get up in arms where you say, no, what do you mean a woman? A woman can do anything a man can do. Um, well, uh, we would say a woman cannot be a pastor of a church. You know, and that is not politically correct. That is not ecclesiastically correct. You know, in our in, in our in our modern age, you know, to, to say that 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 role and and what uh, well, it's we'll look at First Timothy two, but after First Timothy three gives the qualifications for a, an elder for a pastor, and one of the first qualifications is he needs to be the husband of one wife. A woman can never meet that. She cannot be a husband of one wife. That, that, that can't happen, uh, you know, and, because, and if that's a qualification, uh, then, then that's something that can't happen. Let, let's look at the, like, we, we, we're, oh, Lord. What's that? And he that. Uh, but they call them, it's, they're both wives. Yeah, they're and, both. And well, oh, I don't know yeah. what's inside the call. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you never, yeah, that, I, I didn't hear your comment, but just hearing the, I, I can imagine, I can imagine what you say. Yeah, they, they are redefining gender roles and whether you, what sex you are, I guess, uh, you know, maybe our, our society would, would, would re redefine that. Um, we were warned not to let the, the world creep into the church, mm -hmm. and that's what's trying to happen. Yeah, it is. Yes. It was. And this is, you know, it's the same thing, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church, this is the same thing going on in the Catholic Church, it's going on in the Protestant Church, you know, and, and it's, you know, the different denominations, but it's, you know, this, and how big of a battle is this, you know, uh, and, you know, this is a debated thing. Well, look at uh, 1 Timothy 2 verses, uh, well, we'll just look at, at, at one verse, this, beginning in verse 9, it, it, he's talking here about, you know, orderly worship in 1 Timothy 2, how, how the church, when it meets together in an orderly way, instructions for women in church, but verse 12 is the, 
uh, is the catch-all in this, but I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Um, within the church, the, the main teaching, preaching role is to be done by a qualified man. A woman is not allowed. Um, uh, you can go on reading, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into tr transgression. And so from, Paul says from the very beginning this is so, because God made Adam first and then Eve, and because of the deception that happened to Eve, that set up the headship and how things are, are, are to be done. Part of the office of a pastor is to be an overseer and to be looking out for danger. Doctrine, false doctrine coming in. He is to be an overseer. Uh, that is not the, the woman's role to look out for danger because she is easily deceived. Okay. Now that doesn't sound right in our modern age, but that is what the scripture says. Okay. Um, let, let me read one more. 1 Corinthians 14. Um, and we're, we've gone into overtime. Do we still want to look at one other verse or to hash any of this out? Okay, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Just to give you some of the, the scriptural verses on this, uh, and then you can wrestle with them in our own uh, minds and maybe uh, throughout the, uh, the, the, the... 1 Corinthians 14. Well, let me start in verse 33, because here again, he, he's, this is the context, is how the orderly operation of the church, how the church is to be ordered, and he's talking about gifts, how, how they're to be done in verse 33, for God is not the God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The church is to operate in a certain orderly fashion. Well, how is that order to be? The women are to keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or, uh, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things that I write to you are the Lord's command. Now hear this very prickly passage that our modern day society hates. He, uh, Paul says, this is the Lord's command. I do not permit the woman to teach in the public assembly to be the preacher. That, that, that's improper. It's out of order. It is not in orderly worship. So sometimes churches that will have the tag team, the, the husband and wife tag team preachers, that's, that's disorderly. That's out of order. Uh, from and as Baptists, that's 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 uh, that's what we hold to. Now, like I said, that doesn't go well with our society, but that that's our doctrinal stance. Um, I'll, I'll 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 leave it at that. Anybody want to throw anything out since we've already gone five minutes over? We had a pretty good stir in our state when Billy Graham's daughter was invited to speak at one of our. I don't know if it's the convention or convention. evangelism conference, but it, there was quite a few, uh, quite a few pastors within the state that got upset, and she was uninvited to speak. Oh, right. And that's that's been in the last 15, 20 years, I know. Well, just within the past uh, couple of years, there's been. Baptist churches within our association that had been disfellowshipped over this very issue because they, they called, they had a, a woman pastor. And so well, you can continue to be a church, but you can't be a Southern Baptist church in friendly cooperation if you're going to have a, a woman pastor. Uh, because we would say that, that, that that's out of order. Um, that's, that's a disorderly way to conduct church. It's directly contrary to scripture. Yeah. So, yes. Okay, where it says that women is not to speak, that's mm -hmm. being preached, right? Yeah, so we, we, you know, I, you know, I be, because the context here, if you read the whole context in First Corinthians fourteen, and it's talking about it ended up there with the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, and it's speaking in the church, 
And so within the gap, when the church gathers together in the public assembly and is to be addressed and instructed by the word of God, that instruction is to become, is to come from the qualified man. Now, outside of that, I mean, there are, I mean, the women are to teach, they're involved. I mean, they have the gift and can be involved with that, but not in the public assembly. Uh, we would say it is disorderly within, within the public assembly. Um, and like I said, that, that, that is becoming a, Increasingly controversial, even you know, even even in our Baptist churches. But that is, uh, you know, um, well, I hate to. I don't know if I hate to end on a cover. I, I, I like controversy because I hope it, it stirs us to. You know, what does the Scripture say? And again, it comes back to what's going to govern us. Is it the laws of Christ? Is it Scripture alone, or do we have to bend the Scripture to the culture of the day? And that you know, in whether it's this arena or, or any other arena. As Baptists, we say, no, it's just scripture alone, even if it goes totally contrary to the culture. Um, but. Well, God holds the key to the kingdom, so mm -hmm. he's the one you better play. Mm -hmm. And he made the rules. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, you know, he's, he set up a... I mean, it's, it's really it's the same argumentation in the, uh, for the home, that the, the husband is the head of the wife and is supposed to be the leader in the home. You know, it, it's improper for the wife to be the leader of the home. That's, that's out of order. Uh, does, she has an important role that can't be done anywhere else, but the headship belongs to the husband. Um, and same in, in, in the, the, the same in the leadership of the church. And we say with the pastor, it doesn't delineate here the deacon. Uh, because some Baptist churches do have deaconesses, or deacons and deaconesses, but the role of the pastor, we would say, is reserved for a qualified man. Um, well, we'll close on that, that and hopefully have some good food for thought, and maybe we can address it another time. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. It, uh, it challenges us, uh, and uh, Lord, help us uh, to... I want to, to please you and what we do is we when we come together as your gathered uh, gathered people might uh, might our assemblies be done in an orderly uh, in a worshipful way in a way that honors you and encourages people uh, to seek you and to believe in you and I pray this in Christ's name amen, amen.